You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Father, as we we look into your word this morning, we want to be, in one sense, like newborn babies, longing for the milk of the word. But in another sense, those who have been who have been uh, caused to be able to use their senses to discern right and wrong by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, as we look into your word, we ask that you would, even this morning, give us what you would have for each one of us, as only you can do. And as Paul was giving what the Corinthians needed to them. Let us learn from that. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. So, let's, let's read chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. We'll start there. All 23 verses. 1 Corinthians 3. <clears throat> and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able <laughs> for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become foolish that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then, Let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So we actually made it to verse. I think we finished verse three, but we're going to quickly recap them because it's been long enough. The cult of personality can become a displacing thing in so many areas of our lives, whether it's in sports or politics or even in church, in, in, uh, in, in um, worship in the Lord. You see so many people who are lifted up on a pedestal. And if they are really good at what they do, were they not given that by God? Were they not given that gift by God? And, what, and we're going to see as Paul works through this in chapter 3, Dealing with spiritual babes who should have been, you know, this is five years into their, the forming of their church. They should have been ready and taking, they should have been teachers, as he said to the Hebrews. But they're not spiritual, they're fleshly. They're, Paul has to speak to them as children, giving them milk and not the solid food of Scripture. Although they're, and that's, it's an interesting irony because there's plenty of solid food in 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's, it's just that Paul had to keep telling them. That you had to spoon feed it to them. Their theology is resulting in bad behavior. Good theology lived out 
results in good behavior. Bad theology lived out results in bad behavior and bad outcomes. Um, they are factional. They are party spirit. They like one guy more than the next. They lift one guy up above the other. Um, it's a typical, it's a typical Greek um, thinking paradigm, if you will. So then Paul will, uh, he's going to get into the analogy of building. And I know we've got some builders in here and I'll be kind of working off their knowledge when we have the back and forth. But it was remarkable to me uh, how they built back then and what the concepts were. But, but foundations are important. They were important then and they're important now. He's going to revisit the world's wisdom and God's wisdom and he's going to finish up the chapter reminding the Corinthians that they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and that Christ belongs to God and they need to begin acting like it. Acting like they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he starts out and we're just going to quickly work through the first three verses to kind of get us back up to speed. Um, I could not... I, brethren... Remember, he calls them brethren. That's a, it's a loving, it's a kind thing. He calls them brethren. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but unto, as, as unto carnal, even as unto babes. So he castigates them, and he reminds them, and we need to be reminded that there are, you've heard it, there are two types of people, there are three types of people. Well, there's two types of people in the world. Regenerate and unregenerate. There's regenerate, there's unregenerate, let me start there, who are not children of the King. They've not trusted Christ, they're not believers. And their behavior will reflect that. And their end will reflect that. And then there are the regenerate. And fortunately, we have the Holy Spirit to move in the regenerated people, regenerated Christians, and cause them to live out, as it talks about in Ephesians 2, the works that God has foreordained for them to live out. But regenerate people can do dumb things. No. No, you say. Yes, it's true. And maybe you've heard of it happening somewhere, sometime. They can be carnal. They can live like they are fleshly. And so, Paul warns them um, about this carnality. He warns them that they are Christians who are acting in a worldly way. They're acting in a fleshly way. And it ought not to be. And it's part, it's their theology. They're babes. They have not imbibed the things of the Lord as they properly should have. Verse 2, he says, I fed you with milk when he started with them, and not with meat, because before, for hitherto, you were not able to bear it. But he says, neither now are you able. And that is a a remonstrance. remonstrance. He's, He's castigating them. Before, when I first gave you the gospel, it's understandable that you would be babes and that you wouldn't want meat. You don't start people out with the hypostatic union, do you? Sunday School 101, nine-year-olds. Children, this morning we will discuss the hypostatic union. Kids without front teeth can't pronounce it without spitting on you. But there was a time that that was passed. And then Paul said, you're not yet now able. Following hard on the castigation in verse 1, he admonishes them that while they should have been advanced beyond the ABCs of the gospel, he must rebuild the foundation, uh, because they apparently didn't get it the first time. They're acting like children. Now, there's a proper desiring of the word like a newborn babe. And I, I think I used the analogy of watching our calves, our newborn calves. Um, they're not so newborn now, but they still, they just go after mama's milk, just like they're going to die if they don't get to it. And, and it should be, so should it be with us. We should desire the pure word of God. But, we should be grown in respect to salvation, it says in 1 Peter 2.2. 2. So these believers should have been far beyond that, or at least beyond that. Let me just say beyond that. Beyond the milk. Um, they should have been beyond the stage of the basics. They should have been more into the kinds of things like understanding the union, the Trinity. As much as we're able to... Frankly, I love what Jim does with the questions... And, and bringing the heresies and explaining these kinds of things. But if you're like me, there's an element of the Trinity that is just unknowable. 
It's a remarkable and incredible thing. And I'm, I'm excited to know that now I see through a glass darkly. There, I'll be face to face. There's going to be a lot of questions that will be answered that were either not answered or were partially answered here. And I believe one of them will be a fuller understanding of the Trinity, of how that works. Anyway, so Paul says, at the beginning, when I first met you, when I first founded this church, I fed you with the milk of the gospel because you, were, you weren't able to bear meat at first, and that's normal. That's normal. But now, here, five years later, approximately, I still have to feed you with milk because you're still without the power to assimilate further teaching. They won't obey the light they were given. And so God's not going to give them further light. Their senses will be, if they will choose to obey the, the meat and the milk even, their senses will become trained to discern between good and evil. And then the, factual, the factionalism, the division, and the kinds of things that they're struggling with will begin to disappear. And what a mature church, a, a more, more mature church looks like, frankly, and I, I don't want our heads to get swelled, but looks like this, like what we have here. Loving believers who get along well, even with their differences, who know how to serve one another, who know how to reach out to the community, who understand the gospel, who are excited still. How, how many of you have been Christians more than 10 years? More than 20. And I won't embarrass anybody by going any farther. Are you still excited? About what the Lord Jesus has done. Yeah. It's just like. (laughs) You can't really compare it. But it's like. Guys who really like to run equipment. You know. You see a 60 year old guy out there in a bobcat. And you go. Little boys never grow up. And that's how it should be. It should be a delighted seeking after the word. And after the father. And after the son. And trusting in the Holy Spirit. But. Because of their pride, because of their unwillingness to, to obey God, they were still caught in factionalism. They were still people who he couldn't give meat to. So he's going to give them, and we're going to see as we go through chapter 3, much, much more. So, it must be said again that to the obedient Christian, nothing will be hidden. One, one commentator put it this way, so we understand that even children can be taught deeper things of the gospel. New Christians can be introduced and taught the deeper things of the gospel. It's just that, he said, the difference between milk and solid food is one of degrees, not kind. Every doctrine that can be taught in seminary can be taught to children, though not in the same words. There are not two gospels, one for the learned and one for the unlearned. There's no part of the gospel that we are authorized to keep back from people. But it's the method, it's the timing, it's how it's done. And you would think, People that had been under teaching, they were under Apollos' teaching for five years, however long he was there. They ought to be ready. So it is that the that a babe in Christ may understand that Jesus, and so that's why I put this up. He may understand that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is God who came down, became a man, suffered and died, and paid the penalty of sinful man, thus freeing us from sin, giving us his righteousness, and taking our sinfulness on him. This would be milk, but it's wonderful milk. For those who would have their senses exercised to discern good and evil, they would recognize that there are those who believe in this, that in this concept, we have a situation in which his two natures were mixed or that he was a God man. Not true. Deeper inquiry, deeper inquiry, comparing scripture with scripture and studying the concepts given yields a very different picture to the Christian who wants at the meat of scripture. Jim taught this, as I mentioned some time ago, and it's not a bad idea to simply review is the difference between meat and milk. And so you have a nice Latin or Greek word that describes the concept you're going to teach and then you explain it. And so, in many cases, there were other chart. I have a chart here that talks about Jesus' two natures. You can see that as God, he is worshipped. As man, he worshipped the Father. That's the difference in what the two natures were responsible to do. He was called God as God. He was called man as as a man. He was called the Son of God as God. He was called the Son of Man, as man. He, he is prayed to in Acts, and he prayed to the Father in John 17. He is sinless, but he was tempted as man. He knows all things as God. He grew in wisdom as man. He gives eternal life, but in, as man, he died. All the fullness of deity dwells in him as God, but as man, he has a body of flesh and bones. And so you can, if, if you will, and no pun intended, you can flesh this out and understand even more deeply, the concept of the Trinity, the concept of the fact that Christ is God in human flesh. (laughs) 
So, and that pretty much is, uh, let me see if I'm, we're just about there. Then in verse verse 3, he says, for you are still fleshly. For there, and how does he know? How can you tell when people are not practicing good theology? Their behavior will reveal it. He said, you're still fleshly. How do I know? For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? So they're still fleshly. Their behavior reveals it. Should the church look different than the world? Dumb question. Of course it should. It should be radically, properly, radically different. These guys weren't. So the Greeks love their wrangling and they love arguing. But there should be no place for that in the Christian church. Sharpening iron looks far different in the church than it does amongst unbelievers, amongst these types of philosophies. <clears throat> so, Paul says to Timothy, here's how you're supposed to do it in the church. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. It's far easier just to yell at someone, tell them they're dumber and opposed to move on. But it's far more important that we take the time, especially with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to spend the time helping them get to where they need to be. We, we, we love them and take them where they are in Christ. But our desire is to see them to move up, up in their understanding of Christ. Second Timothy 2, 23 and 26. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing they produce quarrels. Do we? <laughs> I wouldn't even get into it. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Boy, did I struggle with that. I, I, I talked to you about a t-shirt my uncle used to wear, but I could have worn it too. You know the one that said, everyone is entitled to my opinion. With gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may become to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Both believers and unbelievers ought to be the recipients of our kindness, of our persuasion. That doesn't mean we don't recognize the foolishness of what some of them believe and attack it necessarily properly as so. But we should be not quarrelsome and not uh, apt and not uh, impatient. And quarrelsome and rebuking unkindly. So when Paul said that the Corinthians were walking like mere men, mere men, mere men, he meant they were conducting their lives in an irrational and fleshly way. Their carnality would become the seedbed for ruined morals, damaged interpersonal relationships, milk toast prayer life, and heresy. Uh, carnality flies in the face of proper doctrine and good behavior, and jealousy. In this particular case, what he's talking about, jealousy can be a driving force. They were to walk. They were to regulate their life. They were to conduct themselves. They were to, to pass along in their lives as people who were given to instruction, patience, not quarrelsomeness. And they weren't doing that. They loved to argue. The, the, kind, of, the kind of love that we see where people enjoy stirring things up. They like to just Toss stuff in to see what happens. That's just, Christians ought not to do that. It's not so much that they were being human. It's the simple fact that they who were indwelt by the Holy Spirit were acting just like every other human on the face of the planet. They were being selfish, immature, prideful, and egotistic. One commentator put it this way. Being human is not a bad thing in itself any more than being flesh is. What is intolerable is to have received the Spirit, which makes one more than merely human. And don't misunderstand me. We're not divine. We're not little God people. It makes you more than merely human, though you are now indwelt by the, Son, by the Spirit of God. It makes them, more than, makes them more than merely human. And to continue to live as if one were nothing more. And that's what Paul was getting after him for. So that's where we, that's where we left off. And that was kind of a a fairly long introduction to get us back up to speed. So, verse 4. Here's, here's another um, manifestation of their factionalism, their, 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 um, their division. And it's, the, it's a manifestation of the cult of personality. And it's remarkable today to me 
and that's not necessarily what was happening exactly here, but what we will do is someone, some famous person becomes a Christian, and instantaneously we give them a, the position of teacher. <laughs> do not lay hands suddenly, Paul said. Let Get to know them. Instruct them. Bring them up to speed. So he says, for when, I, when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not mere men? <laughs> These are the words and actions of fleshly, immature believers. Pitting one leader against another. Maybe they were not intentionally doing that. But that will be the result. Uh, godly leaders, if they were in this situation, would see that. And I suspect, well, Paul did, and I'll bet you Apollos did too. Bet is probably not a good term, but I would, I would guess that Apollos did the very same thing. Godly leaders will see this pitting, this factionalism, and they will fall to their knees and beg God, as Paul did, for the church to repent from putting much stock, so much stock, into men. When people look for someone to put a stamp of approval on their behavior, serious problems arise. The creating and sustaining of factions results when selfishness is at the heart of interpersonal relationships. What I want, what I think, and I want you to like my guy. It's my guy you need to be behind. It's hard to say what all the causes of this were, but certainly ego, pride, selfishness were at the root. The Corinthians were still struggling. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the Corinthians were still struggling with their need to, um, to be somebody important or their need to be in the camp of somebody important. The raising up of human leaders have mul has multiple destructions that come in its wake. First, there's the problems of the believers themselves. They are clinging to men and not to God. Remove this into the, and I don't want to get too far into this, but in the world of politics, somehow we think electing one guy is going to solve 125 years of deviation. Why do we think that? It's, we, as, an, as people, we tend to put our, all our eggs in the basket of some person who's going to, say, going to come save the day. Well, only one person ever could do that. And he's already done that. He came and he saved the day. Putting all your eggs in that basket, raising up of human leaders has multiple destructions. The first problem is the believers, I said, as I said, themselves, whether it's Christian believers or in a political situation, those believers clinging to the idea, clinging to a man, clinging to an individual and not to God. Not to God. Their focus is earthly, not heavenly. A second problem is that the leaders themselves may actually start to believe what their followers are saying about them. As one man said, they may, they may start believing their own press releases. <clears throat> Nothing pumps someone up more than being praised, and especially if it's false and they don't recognize about themselves that it's false. It's actually unbiblical for believers to compare those in leadership or indeed to even become, as the Corinthians had become, followers of some of those in leadership. One commentator went so far to label it sin, and I think he's correct. He said this, It is sinful for church members to compare pastors or for believers to follow human leaders as disciples of men and not disciples of Jesus Christ. The personality cults in the church today are in direct disobedience to the Word of God. Only Jesus Christ should have the place of preeminence. And if you have leadership that doesn't recognize, they shouldn't be in leadership. Yes, it's probably a combination of things. It, it becomes a problem when you look to them more than you look to the Word, first of all. And secondly, when your relationship is one that centers on individuals and people rather than on the person and work of Christ. So it's what are your leaders saying to you? Are they saying, yeah, I can help you with that. There's, I've, I've this and I've that and I know this and I know that and I can do this. and I, Or they say, you know, the, the Father... In, in the Scripture, here's what the Scripture says. How can we apply that? It's often a matter of degree, not just... If you, if, they, if you elevate them, yes, don't elevate men. Thankful, Be thankful to God for the leaders that He's placed over you, but be Berean with them as well, because they are men. I'm a man. I'm wrong dozens of times a day, I'm sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a book written about me. It's called Three Felonies a Day. 
This guy believes that the average law-abiding American citizen commits three felonies a day unknowing. We all, we all are responsible to hold one another lovingly accountable. And as we recognize that, we're going to be far less likely to put someone on a pedestal. So where we look to them first, we don't go to prayer. We don't go to our, we don't go to what is, what is God telling us through the scripture? What is, what has our behavior been so far? Uh, often the difficulties we struggle with are things that God will solve with us if we would but come to him. But again, he does use counselor and a multitude of counselors. There is safety. And that's a good thing. Just don't let the cult of this person, this guy knows everything. No. No, he doesn't. Nobody knows everything. I know that nobody knows everything. Let me think about that for a minute. Okay, that's not everything. Pardon? Christ knows everything. So, what, what was happening here, though, Robert, was more, they were, they were pitying. They were saying, well, <laughs> I like Jim. And uh, I like Dave better. Oh, Jess, you, you need to... That's the, an example. That's an evidence that something wrong is going on in that body. That doesn't happen here, but I can use that as an example. The elevation should be for Christ only. He has the preeminence, Ron. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a good catch. MacArthur says this. Piper says that. Whereas if you hear them say that and you go to the scripture yourself and you verify it and you go, oh, I didn't understand that before, but I, can, I see what he's talking about. The Lord said this. <laughs> that's more important. That whatever it is that your leaders drive you to the Word, they drive you to Christ. They drive you to the Holy Spirit. Because in the end, all of us are but men and women. And all of us can fall. All of us can make mistakes. But the Lord never, 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 says in Hebrews, will leave you nor forsake you. It says it three times. Sort of, kind of. So, this name dropping is a sign of immaturity, insecurity, and even sin. So, good, good discussion. Um, again, I don't want to put down the fact that there are, God has given the, the church good teachers. And we have one here. Oh, we should never lift that person up. We should be grateful and thankful and pray for them daily. But we should look to the Lord and lift Christ up. For He is the one who made us righteous. Paul says, can I make you righteous? Did I die for your sins? And that's a good way to look at it. Any other questions about verse 4? Comments? Does that help? Verse 5. And... <laughs> And do you think Paul liked Apollos? Yeah. I bet they were good friends. So here he says, here's what he says. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? What am I? He says, servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I want to put it this way. Why look at the bus boys, Paul said. The chef created the meal you're eating. You got a good waiter? Tip him. But he didn't make the bacon. Is there anything better than bacon? After all? But he didn't make the meal. The chef prepared the meal. When you want to honor a teacher, you don't make a statue of their pencil or their desk. Hopefully you don't make a statue at all. But The pencil and the desk are some of the implements that the teacher used to facilitate the instruction. So it is with servants of the living God. So it is with servants of the living God. They are simply there, installed by God himself, to bring the good news, to teach, to instruct, to patiently rebuke and encourage, to be part of that. God himself brings the good news, though. It's still his good news. The Corinthians would have understood this, especially with the words Paul used. He used the word diakonos, from which we get our English word deacon. And it's a cool etymology. The word means, comes from an ancient Greek root which means someone who's so busy doing things that he stirs up dust. He's always busy doing, serving, helping, and he stirs up dust. I don't know if I got it in here. From diaconus properly means to kick up dust as one running, around, running an errand or so busy helping, so busy serving, so busy caring that they stir up dust by virtue of their activity. That's what Paul and Apollos were. That's what the leadership in the church is. They're deacons, if you will. They're servants. 
This would be the proper way to look at the servants of God. The bus boys who bring the meal. Lifting them up as something other than that gives us a cult of personality that we have in the church today. And so we have the big televangelists who have begun believing their, as I said, believing their own press releases. The Holy Spirit only needs willing servants. He does not need somebody with letters after their name. This is not to disparage education, but one's learning and abilities are all gifts from the hand of our good God. And if someone believes that their gifts and abilities are something that they have drummed up, cultivated, or even created, they are sadly misinformed. James reminds us of this when he said in James chapter 1, verse 17, Every good thing given, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So Paul is driving home the message to the Corinthians. Stop with this person. Personality. Personality. That's a new word. Personality. Cult. This cult of personality. Stop with it. Any questions on verse 5? So now we're going to see some. What did Paul do? He says, I planted. Verse 6. I planted. What did Apollos do? He watered. But God was causing the growth. Or in the King James, God gave the increase. Those of you who plant in ten gardens know full well that you can plant, you can water, you can weed, you can pray, you can till, you can lovingly look at it, you can caress the tomato plants, but in the end, you can't make the plants grow. You can put fertilizer on them, but in the end, you cannot make the plants grow. Paul, Paul acknowledges his part. I water, I planted, he says. That's my part, I planted. He acknowledges Apollos' part. He watered. Paulus came and ministered as their pastor and watered the new plants, but it's God who causes the growth and the beauty that comes in the life of a believer. To allocate anything else to the gardeners is folly, Paul says. There's no, there is a place for appreciating the work that God's servants do among believers. But when Paul advised the Thessalonians to appreciate those who had charge over them, he accompanied that advice, interestingly enough, with a warning that they live in peace with one another. Probably because of what he saw in Corinth. The Holy Spirit uh, inspired him to keep that in the mix of his discussion, of his explanation. It seems that there's a very real danger any time we give great credit to humans that it upsets the peace that should characterize the church, the peace and harmony. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, he said this, 12 and, 12, 12 and 13. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And I, I, I that, that's, a, that's a remarkable coherence with the whole book of the whole first three chapters of First Corinthians. Esteem those highly who have charge over you and who instruct you, but live in peace with one another. Do it rightly. And and. And from the leadership, from the servant's position, um, how many of you are delighted when you see your kids not make the mistakes you made? I mean, you know, I, I haven't met a parent yet that goes, I sure wish he'd foul up more like I did. No, it's, well, I watch my kids, they learn from my stupidity. And they, you know, it's like, no, I read in the, the dictionary that arsenic is poison. I'm not going to try it. I'll just take your word for it. So they haven't done some of the things I did. And I'm grateful. I'm delighted. And so that's, that's the attitude that uh, an instructor, a teacher, a servant has when they are able to bring truth and help to someone and that someone bypasses the pain that they went through themselves. It's delightful. It's a wonderful thing. So, and let it be said that a true servant of Christ who has been given the responsibility of teaching and preaching is delighted and humbled as he sees the plants that Christ is tending and giving growth to, growing and becoming more like him, the teacher, or more like Christ? No, more like Christ. So, on the one hand, you can say, follow me as I follow Christ. But you should pull like this and point like that. Look past me to the Savior. Look past me to the Son of God. So, he knows, the instructor, the teacher, the servant, he knows that it is all the work of the Holy Spirit. My boss used to have to rein me in from time to time when we were working together. and uh, He used to knock on doors a lot. And, and we worked together ministering a little bit. He would always say to me, you know, Razor, the Holy Spirit was doing fine before you came along. 
And he could get away with that. Not anyone. That would actually have been a patient for him. A patient, gentle remonstrance. <laughs> Trust me, it was. So, it's when we become certain that we are responsible for growth in the church that we elevate ourselves and thus create a situation where the body may help in that elevation to the destruction of the church of Jesus Christ. There's simply no place for that kind of idea and attitude. Planting and watering are tremendously important, but the growth is the true object, and it is caused and sustained by God and by God only. Any comments or questions about verse 6? We'll finish up with verse 7. So Paul says, so then, he says in verse 5, there's verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Verse 7, so then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now, this is not self-implication or, or, you know, hanging your head saying, I'm nothing. This is truth. God is everything. The waters and the planters, while needful and useful, are not, there's nothing compared to God. It's important that the servants in the church not deceive themselves. For deceiving themselves about their supposed accomplishments and abilities, they will indeed deceive the church and the believers. And unfortunately, they can foment or cause or increase or improve or cause to happen more people looking to them, looking to the, to the, to the, uh, to the servant rather than to the king. Unfortunately, there's going to be many who participate in that deceit and think that the planters and the waters are more important than the giver of life. Scripture is replete in both the Old Testament and the New Testament with advice about who you give glory to. <coughs> who do we give glory to for the good things in our lives? God says, I will not share my glory with anyone. He wouldn't share it with Peter. He wouldn't share it with Paul. He wouldn't share it with anyone. And those were his servants, his blessed apostles, his servants. Psalm 115.1, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness. Because of your truth. And Isaiah 42, 8. I, the Lord says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Isaiah 48, 11. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory? I will not give to another. And then John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Why? For apart from me, you can do nothing. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so, as we, as we, next week, we'll, we'll talk about rewards. Waters and planters are rewarded. And there's nothing wrong with rewards. Rewards are good. I've got uh, 21 scriptures talking about rewards we'll look at next, next week. But what are rewards for? What is the servant of God excited about winning rewards for? So that he can hand them to his king and say, by your grace, this was for you. It's not much, but would you take it? And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, not only will I take it, but you will rule. Because you were faithful and little, you will rule over much. Well done, good and faithful servant. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? To have Jesus look you in the eye and say, well done. When my dad did that, it was just the coolest thing. Because I knew he didn't give that praise lightly. When he would say, good job. You did a good job there. It was encouraging. It would cause me to even strive to please him more. It should be the same. And for these Corinthians, they should stop looking at Paul and Apollos. Stop looking at who was most important. And put their focus back on the Son of God, who gave them their righteousness, who gave them their life, and who gave them the Holy Spirit, so that they could live out that, that righteousness day by day. And they weren't doing it, but I, I well, you know there's not a third Corinthians, so I'm thinking maybe they got it after two books. What an exciting thing. What an exciting thing it is to, to see people grow. And so Paul wants these people to grow. He wants them to turn from their own silly ways, from their fleshly ways, from their worldly ways, from their unwise ways, and recognize that their wisdom is the wisdom of the world. 
This is the wisdom of God. That Paul was a planter, Apollos was a water, God was the growth giver. Let's pray. So Lord, as we, as we look in our lives at the people that you've given to us to instruct us, we are so grateful and we want to honor them in a manner that brings glory to you. Let us always look for ways to serve one another as Paul and Apollos did in this book in 1 Corinthians. To serve one another, but to do it in such a way that we always point and give the glory to the Son of God who gave his life for us that we might live. And we'll thank you for what you're doing in this body and for what you're doing in each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.